Well, hello everyone. This is a little bit of a change up, a bit of a curveball, so to speak. I am, uh, I'm out on a walk right now, a beautiful sunshine walk on the old farming road back behind my house, getting kissed by a dose of sunshine. And, um, you know, I had a little snafu with my podcast this morning in that I, I released the wrong episode. Oops, bad me. And I got it all fixed, but it kind of resulted in me, uh, me basically wanting to get some, some fodder, some questions from my wonderful, wonderful followers here on Instagram Live um, that I'm actually going to plan on releasing uh, as part of a podcast Q&A and Newsflash episode this, uh, this very weekend. So this is your chance to get featured on, on the podcast. Now, um, I had thought about making people who ask questions a guest and bringing you on live with me. It's possible that I am just too much of a Luddite to pull that off. And so what I may do instead is read questions that you have, whether it's questions, for example, I've gotten a lot of them about that pre-workout mix that I posted to Instagram recently to news flashes I've done to, you know, the latest questions you might have about biohacks or nutrition or fitness or anything like that. We're just going to jam for a little while here. I don't know how long. And uh, I'll reply to your questions. Now, if you are listening to this podcast when it comes out, technically, this is podcast number 434. You'll obviously be aware that since I'm walking outdoors, the audio is you know, not the highest quality, but I promise that the content will be I8. <laughs> so anyways, I've just finished preparing myself a little bit of salmon for lunch. It's hunting season, so I was out hunting this morning for white-tailed deer. Did another hunt over the lunch hour. Had a little bit of salmon. I'm going on a walk now, and then I'll be out hunting again this evening. So, let's just dive into your Q&A. And of course, the first question is a shameless promotional question from Joey's Hot Sauce, asking me, what's your favorite hot sauce? Duh. That's a totally planted question. So, uh, let's go ahead and skip that question and go straight into the first question about, and this is a great one, Healthy Ketosis Life says, how should hunger feel? This is a really, really interesting question because it confuses a lot of people, right? Like, basically, you know, how do you know if your hunger is a craving uh, or if your hunger is actual, legitimate, physiological need for calories or low blood sugar, or perhaps central nervous system fatigue from low amounts of amino acids, which technically can allow tryptophan to cross your blood-brain barrier and make you sleepy. And I, I have to tell you that the number one metric I have found to assess whether I'm not, I'm truly hungry, if we're looking at this from a technology standpoint, and then I'll give you kind of like the poor person's version of this shortly, is to use a blood glucose monitor or a continuous blood glucose monitor. Without fail, if I'm hungry and my blood glucose is below, for me, about 80, and I found this to be the case for many other people, that's a sign that it's true low blood sugar and that I may actually have a need for calories. Are there wrenches that could be thrown to the equation? Absolutely. For example, you could have just eaten a meal and be experiencing a hypoglycemic drop, in which case, if you were to look at a continuous blood glucose monitor, your blood glucose would be really, really high and then drop low. That's typically not a sign of hunger. Usually, true hunger is when the blood glucose is low and has stayed low for a certain period of time, typically like a good 40 to 60 minutes at, at 80 or below. Another example in which this wouldn't be an accurate metric would be if you've, say, consumed a serving of ketone esters. Ketone esters, I have found, and ketone salts to a certain extent, tend to lower blood glucose dramatically, probably because you really don't need much of a throughput of glucose when you have ketones in your system. But even though blood glucose is low, you're probably not hungry or in need of much fuel because you have those ketone esters in your bloodstream. Now, that poor person's version that I alluded to is the old standby. That's the, uh, the love of registered dietitians and nutritionists the world round. If you're hungry, 
drink a great big glass of water, and then wait 10 to 15 minutes. And if you're still hungry after drinking 16 to 24 ounces of water, you know, I always have one of those big glass mason jars around, then you probably actually are hungry. You probably actually do need calories. Furthermore, if you find yourself hungry day after day and you're noticing loss in lean mass, right? Like I use a Withings body scale at my house to measure not only my weight, but also my, my lean mass, my body fat percentage then that could be a sign that you are under fueling. Also, if you're taking blood measurements and you're seeing low thyroid, low testosterone, uh, low progesterone, kind of that cluster of factors that would dictate that you are underfed, then obviously that's a little bit more of an invasive measurement, but that can give you a good clue too. So technically, true hunger should feel as though you're hungry slash be accompanied by low blood glucose levels slash not be something that's fixed with something as simple as drinking a, a giant glass of water. So hopefully that kind of kind of answers your question to a certain extent, healthy ketosis life. Um, <laughs> Chris B2211 says, what would you tell Joe Rogan? Uh, I believe you're referring to the fact that Joe Rogan uh, got, uh, got COVID. Uh, from what I understand, he recovered from it. Uh, he did ivermectin, which is also what I did when I got COVID, and which I, uh, I, I think can vastly accelerate the, the bounce back process from that, and also decrease potential for development of long haul COVID. However, let's say someone has you know taken their ivermectin, they've gone to, and this is my recommendation, the Institute for Functional Medicine website, and you can literally like Google this, uh, Function, Institute for Functional Medicine COVID, they have their entire line of, of research proven supplements, dosages, everything over there for everything from selenium to zinc to vitamin C, etc. Many of which are also anti-inflammatories, which means that those are also things that can, because they're decreasing cytokines and inflammation, lower the risk for developing long haul COVID and may also decrease COVID duration and also the severity of COVID symptoms. Uh, let's say you're, you're already doing that though, like you've used something like avermectin, maybe hydroxychloroquine, uh, both which may be considered curse words these days, I don't know, and you're following the functional medicine website's recommendation. Um, I have a kind of, it's not a private document, but not a lot of people know about it. If you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash virus QA, at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash virus QA, for the past two years, I've been throwing little snippets, little tricks, little tips little known substances and all sorts of things over there that again will decrease symptom duration and intensity for many people and that also can be used to decrease the potential for development of long haul COVID. Some notable takeaways from that document would include the use, uh, preferably as acutely as possible, of the peptides, thymosin alpha-1, TB500, and BPC-157, all administered as injectable peptides to quell the inflammatory firestorm. They pair quite well if you have a functional medicine doc and you can get these from a functional medicine doc with two other really, really good injectable antioxidants, namely quercetin and oleopurin. That's O-L-E-O-P-U-R-I-N. Very similar to kind of like the potent concentrated flavanol you would, you would get from, uh, from like an extra virgin olive oil. Uh, I recommend that most people who are concerned about COVID or have COVID look into nebulizing, get a desktop nebulizer, and you can nebulize either hydrogen peroxide, which is the kind of like the cheaper but pretty effective version uh, on the daily, typically a couple of times a day. You can also nebulize something I think is even better. I take something called glutostat, uh, which I order from Dr. John Laurence in Florida. It's glutathione mixed with a whole bunch of essential oils. And then I blend that with colloidal silver and nebulize that. I'll nebulize that, you know, during travel as well. I have a little travel nebulizer. It's great for the immune system, but a, a nebulizer can work fantastically as well. Uh, I recommend an ozone generator if you have access to ozone. Um, at that URL that I gave you, bengreenfieldfitness.com slash virus QA, uh, there is information on the type of ozonation setup and system that I use, but either don't grimace rectal insufflation of ozone or even just drinking ozone water 
um, or uh, using ozone um, with some of the attachments that come with these ozone devices. They typically come with a, a nose attachment uh, for, for breathing in ozone that you pass through olive oil, which kind of puts in this lipophilic medium that makes it non-harsh to your upper respiratory tract. Or uh, you can also deliver the ozone um, into the ears using like, like an ear device that's somewhat similar as well. So the peptides, the nebulizing, the ozone, all the recommendations from the Institute for Functional Medicine. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that I recommend if you're able to is uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which seems to do a really, really good job at mitigating some of the issues that can occur from a, from a vasculature standpoint. And paying attention to blood quality overall, you know, vitamin K, fish oil, a lot of things that would potentially decrease clotting factors. Uh, there's also an herb that I talk about on that page called yarrow. You know, when I got COVID, I harvested a bunch of wild yarrow from my backyard, dried it, dehydrated it, powdered it, pulverized it in a blender, and used that pretty extensively to decrease any risk of, uh, any risk of clotting. You know, and for me, COVID was about a day that I struggled with it, and then it was just gone. None, none of this is considered to be medical advice. I'm just throwing out some of the things based on Chris B's question about what I would do, you know, if I had it. And hopefully that document, again, just a free shared Google Doc I have, bengreenfieldfitness.com slash virus QA, will be helpful to you because it includes pretty much everything that I've ever learned, really, about managing COVID and decreasing potential for long-haul COVID. Uh, Ethan says, did I go to college? And if so, for what? I did go to college. I, I started college when I was 15, just because I was homeschooled and I was ahead of the curve. Um, initially, I studied athletic training. So I worked a lot in the athletic training room, you know, taping ankles, <laughs> learning massage therapy, you know, administering ice baths to people. And didn't take long before I realized I didn't really want to be an athletic trainer. And shifted my major to exercise physiology, which I obviously loved and still use a lot of what I learned there to this day, and uh, put together a self-directed master's degree that was exercise physiology, biomechanics, human nutrition, and pre-med. So I took all the organic chemistry, biochemistry, you know, microbiology, et cetera, et cetera, courses, uh, and uh, basically I took the MCATs as well, got accepted to a bunch of medical schools, um, wound up not going to medical school, and instead, you know, kind of going down the, down the fitness and health and more kind of like preventive aspects of, of human betterment instead. But yeah, I did go to college. I bit off all I could chew. I took 30 to 34 credits a semester for five years, worked five jobs all during college, and uh, um, I was definitely a, a workaholic, type A, hard-charging, high achiever all through college. I slept maybe, I slept about four hours a night all through college and uh, continued to sleep very, very little for the next 10 years after as I built my business, built my company, worked as a personal trainer, worked as an author, you know, worked a whole bunch of different jobs. I've just always worked really hard. My dad was a serial entrepreneur. I watched him just work his fingers to the bone. Same thing with my grandpa. And I'm, I'm trying to raise my children with a better aspect of work-life balance, which I've since adopted. But but yes, I went to college and I, I went in pretty pretty hardcore. I don't think college is for everyone, but uh, but yeah, I, I, I went to college. So let's go with another, uh, another question. Um, let me just look through a few of the questions here to see if there's some that I haven't addressed lately or, or in a while. Um, uh, Ray Pete's opinion on keto and PUFAs. Yeah, this is this idea that by metabolizing excess ketones and particularly polyunsaturated fatty acids, that you are going to create um, potentially more free radicals and more cellular oxidation. Uh, simply because there's not enough carbohydrates to to kind of like downregulate a little bit of the excessive uncoupling protein activity. I'm kind of like bastardizing the full explanation. And I do agree that uh, strict ketosis and especially high, high amount of ketones combined with high amounts of fish oil, combined with a severe amount of carbohydrate restriction, with a lot of people are doing these days, uh, appears to, from a free radical and an inflammation or oxidation standpoint, not be as favorable as moderate ketosis, cyclic ketosis, carbohydrate refeeds, and not like overdosing 
on polyunsaturated fatty acids, including fish oil, and ensuring any polyunsaturated fatty acid intake is from a really good, clean source that hasn't been exposed to a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, a lot of oxidizing factors, etc. So yeah, I think Ray Pete's onto something in terms of the potential for inflammation and excessive oxidation that some people are creating with strict ketosis combined with things like high dose fish oil and hefty intake of saturated fats. But I don't think that a state of nutritional ketosis is overall harmful if it's paired with enough carbohydrate intake, uh, like a cyclic refeed, such as you know a nightly refeed for very busy, you know athletes, or um, you know a, a, a weekend refeed, uh, you know every week or a couple of times a week for a lot of other people, kind of like a five-two type of fasting diet. But yeah, you do need to be careful. You know, I'm not one of those guys who's full on. You know, keto, high dose fish oil, saturated fats, keep fat bombs full of coconut oil in your freezer type of guys. So, um, all right, let's see. Other questions here. Um, any post concussion syndrome tips? I mean, it's a good question just because, you know, any, anybody who prizes brain health should know about some of these tips. Anyone who, say, like, journeys with plant medicines, which I would also consider to be the equivalent of a TBI or concussion in many cases as far as some of the oxidation or inflammation that can create neural tissue. This would also be important. Um, there's a, a guy who I interviewed some time back, Dr. Dan Engel, who's actually a, both a plant medicine facilitator as well as an expert in TBI and concussion management. He has a facility down in Austin, Texas, and he wrote a book called The Concussion Repair Manual. Uh, in addition to that, Dale Bredesen wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's and many of the protocols in that I would also consider to be very good protocols for TBI and concussion. A few of the major takeaways would be, you know, up upon uh, the actual injury itself, not only adequate hydration, but shifting to a very ketone-rich diet. Again, not for life, but for several weeks following the injury simply because glucose can cause a little bit more oxidation when it's metabolized for fuel extensively by the brain post-concussion. Uh, I also like to weave in coconut oil and MCT oil, and also because the impact it can have on, uh, on, on healing up a lot of the issues that occur, even, again, temporarily, slightly higher dose fish oil. I'm a huge fan of the head-worn infrared light devices made by a company called V-Light. V-I-E-L-I-G-H-T. And I'll, I'll link to all this stuff in the show notes if you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 434, uh, unless you're listening to this live, in which case the show notes don't yet exist. Um, so I like the infrared light therapy. They have an alpha unit and a gamma unit. The alpha unit's better. It's a 10 hertz frequency for post-TBI concussion. The gamma one, which is 40 hertz, is better for like meditation, focus, sometimes relaxation, things like that. Hyperbaric oxygen, absolutely, as much as possible, you know, 60 to 90 minutes, preferably some type of blood flow precursor taken beforehand, like beetroot or, you know, sildenafil or Cialis, just something that really opens up a lot of blood vessels prior to getting into the, the hyperbaric. Um, the, uh, a few of the other things that I would recommend you look into would be hefty amounts of grounding and earthing for the inflammatory component. Uh, very similar to what Jack Cruz does when he's using uh, surgical techniques and combining it with cold, using cold thermogenesis, especially for the head. There's even a company called Cryo Helmet, and they make like a, like a head freezing device that literally is like an ice pack for your skull. That's another one that could come in handy. And then uh, if you go to my website, I've done a few really, really extensive podcasts on concussion and TBI management with everyone from fighters to physicians. So, you know, I, I obviously have hours of content that I can't quite scratch the surface on in a kind of a short podcast Q&A, but that is, that, is where I would, that is where I would start as far as like some, some things to look into for the TBI and concussion component. All right, uh, someone says, what do you apply and how do you take care of your hair? Well, again, I have a lot of hair episodes, but I'll tell you exactly what I do right now. Uh, because obviously I'm growing up my hair, growing up my beard, going for that, uh, that I guess, Jesus Christ slash Einstein look these days. And um, every morning I wake up and I use a brush that's like a really bristly brush. And I brush, brush, brush my hair. But that brush is also, you know, very similar like a derma roller for the scalp. And after I've brushed everything, I then wash my face 
pretty intensively. Um, I will often use my hands or what's called a gua sha scraping tool to like get a lot of blood flow to the face. And I, I work my face just like I would a massage therapist every single morning, not only for kind of like a more youthful look, but also for the increase in blood flow, which can assist with, with hair health and follicle health. After I've done all that, like brushing and massaging to my face, typically for about one to two minutes when I first get up, I'll then apply the, uh, the Oxano product that I did a podcast with Jay Campbell about. It's two different formulas. One's copper peptide and one's C60. And I just rub the, the first one vigorously into my hair. You're supposed to let it sit for like a minute or two before you put formula two in. So I'll go like take a pee and then come back and then same thing, just let, rub formula two into my beard, my hair, everything. Um, and then I repeat that whole thing typically at night before bed. The only other thing that I do is I do a clay mask once every week, and I use an actual derma roller for that all over my scalp, my face, everything. I know in my podcast with Dr. Cameron Chestnut, he said that was slightly traumatic to the tissue, but I, I really dig the results I get from it, and I think when used not too frequently, it's just fine. So I do that derma roller, and I do the clay mask afterwards, and when I rub that clay mask off, I do a ton of the uh, the Keon Skin Serum, which is like 12 different oils that I developed, and I, I keep that skin serum in my bag. And anytime out in the sun, you know, after a walk like this, other intervals during the day, I'll just slap that serum on my face. So I go back and forth between the serum and then the, the Oxano C60 and GHK Copper Peptide products. And, um, you know, aside from that, just make sure I get enough collagen, enough amino acids, uh, you know, I don't, don't wear a hat too frequently, so my head gets a lot of oxygen, a lot of infrared light. And uh, that's, that's generally how I care for my hair, even though uh, this is the first time in my life now that I'm growing my hair out that I'm paying more than 10 bucks for a haircut. I didn't realize haircuts cost so much because I usually, up until like a few months ago, just go to Supercuts or whatever and get a haircut. And now I'm going to an actual barber who actually cuts my hair. And she even puts on like safety glasses when she does my beard because apparently it, it, it kicks off a bunch of like sharp little hairs when she when she cuts my beard but uh paying fifty dollars for a haircut is a very very new thing for me I, I never never thought i'd do someone says why do i wear wired earphones versus wireless well that's a great question um even though bluetooth isn't as big of an issue as wi-fi or cell phone radiation um there's some evidence that it can cause a little bit of cell clumping there's some evidence that it does create a little bit of low-level radiation subjectively I find I get faster onset during the day of things like brain fogs, headaches, etc. when I'm taking the majority of my calls on a Bluetooth headset versus a wired headset. So I typically use the Defender Shield air tube headset, or uh, if I'm lazy, like I'm being right now, I just use the wired headset that you get from Apple. And I'm, you know, I, I'm not as concerned about Bluetooth as I am about Wi-Fi and cell phone signals and, and bigger forms of higher intensity, so-called dirty electricity. But if I have the option not to use Bluetooth, I figure, you know, why not why, why not, not use it? So, uh, and, and again, subjectively, I feel better just eliminating as many sources of non-native electricity from my life as I can. Even like all the devices I own in my home, smart appliances, etc. I disable Wi-Fi, I disable Bluetooth. It's just kind of my, my general rule. Um, okay, so let's go, with, uh, let's go with two more questions. Let's go with two more questions. I'm gonna scroll through here. Um, let's see, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. A whole bunch of people are talking about liquid IV. Uh, I don't know how that one popped up, but let's see. Um, do, 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 do. And uh, my audio editor will cut out the awkward parts here in the actual podcast where I'm just sitting here scrolling. Um, okay. Uh, do I run? I love this question. I'm trying to pick a few I've never answered before on podcasts. I ran, you know, I played tennis in college. Uh, up until that point, really hadn't run longer than a mile. Uh, through tennis, really tried not to run too much because I didn't want to convert all my explosive fast twitch muscle fiber to slow twitch muscle fiber. I was a total power athlete, played center for the basketball team, played middle for the men's volleyball team, played singles and doubles tennis, and did a lot of bodybuilding and plyometrics. And then 
about two years into college for I think what would be the first time in my life I ran more than about two miles and I kind of liked it and uh, third year of college wound up signing up for like a 10 mile road race that I got second place in and again I just dug like the meditative aspect of running and just the ability for me to get inside my own head listen to great music and go out for a run and so for the next 20 years yeah I mean like from Ironman triathlon to Spartan racing I ran a ton you know I still had a minimalist running approach because running's hard on the body that eccentric muscle tissue damage so I'd cross train a lot with aqua jogging with elliptical trainers with cycling for my sports but you know I for, for 20 years I would run anywhere from typically about 15 up to around 35 sometimes 40 miles a week um, now I don't run uh, barely at all I play tennis with my family a couple times a week sometimes when I check the mail my driveway which is about 400 meters long I'll run back up the driveway if I'm being chased I'll occasionally run or if I'm chasing my sons during a game of tag I'll run I probably run a total of about one to two miles a week the majority of my cardio comes from battle rope med ball slams airdyne bicycle the Vasper full body electrical muscle or the, the Vasper full body uh, exercise machine and then a lot of the strength training that I do I'm using minimal rest periods and sometimes uh, like body weight, high rep stuff. So I get quite a bit of cardio when I'm doing that. Um, I paddleboard, I play some Frisbee golf, but as far as like going out for a run, bro, let's go out for a run. If you asked me to go out for a run today, right now, it'd be a flat no. I just don't really run anymore frequently at all. And I, I feel pretty good with that. I might, will I start running again someday? Maybe, but right now I enjoy uh minimally running I, I just did it for so long i think i almost like burnt out on it so um all right let's see let's go let's go with uh with one more question and then uh then i think i'm gonna release some of these questions this weekend for maybe the people who couldn't make it live to the to the show a lot of fringe questions about weird growths on people's arms and strange diseases that people have uh please don't don't try to get that stuff solved on an instagram live i i don't recommend it um, okay, here's an interesting one. Do I wear sunscreen? Um, this is the first year of my life where I think, you know, I put on sunscreen one time this entire year. Uh, both me and my sons and my wife will occasionally put on a little bit of coconut oil, which has a natural SPF of around six or so. Um, I use that copper peptide stuff I talked about and also the C60, which I think is great for skin healing. I use the Keon Skin Serum a lot. Uh, our Keon Omegas, I uh, put astaxanthin in those, which is like an internal edible sunscreen. And I take about six capsules of the Keon Omegas every morning. Sometimes I'll take even more astaxanthin than that if I'm going to be out in the sun for a long period of time. But I basically went this entire year, entire summer, through a huge heat wave. You know, Vegas, Spokane, anywhere I go, uh, not wearing sunscreen. And um, it, part of it is due to obviously what most people know about the toxins in a lot of modern sunscreens. Part of it was just an experiment to see if I did burn, if I did notice inflammation or, or wrinkles or, or things like that. And honestly, I, f I feel great. Plus, it's, it's a little bit of a time hack, too, not having to rub in sunscreen every time you go out in the sun. So, yeah, I wear a hat sometimes. I'll cover my body if I'm going to be out in the sun for a long period of time. But, uh, but no, I, I, I don't think I'll ever go back to wearing sunscreen much, uh, much at all. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do, because i got to end pretty soon, is I'm going to end this Instagram Live. Uh, I'm going to put all the show notes when this comes out at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 434. And um, you know, maybe we'll do this every once in a while. The audio isn't going to be great because it's just through my cheap ass, you know, as we've already established, Apple wired headphones. But what the heck, we'll roll with it. And I was inspired to get on and respond to some of your guys' questions. So I love you. Thanks for attending. Thanks for the great questions. And I'll, uh, I'll see you all on the flip side.